Hey everyone, welcome to one of the first episodes of Muskie Town's Let's Talk Fly Fishing. Uh, pretty excited about this episode. We've got a special guest. Uh, we're here today with Jordan Weeks. Uh, he's a senior fisheries biologist with the Wisconsin DNR. Uh, he is one of, I tried to say he's the guy uh, in muskie conservation and, and, and good education, but he, he said that he's one of the guys, uh, but yeah, uh, we're going to go through a bunch of stuff today, everything from early season and pre-spawn kind of best practices, and then we're going to get into some gray area about water temps and kind of what we like to do just for the future of the species, but uh, yeah, Jordan's a wealth of information. We're excited to have him on. Uh, Jordan, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So yeah, I, I kind of want to just guide this a little bit and let you do your thing. Uh, if there's anything you want to add in, please do. Uh, it is in some areas of the country, uh, you know, we were just talking that I was fishing in Tennessee yesterday, it's pre-spawn. Um, in other parts of the country, Wisconsin, Minnesota, everything's still under ice and everyone's chomping at the bit to get out there. So um, let's kind of start with you know, conservation best practices and any information you think is going to be helpful around uh, early season fishing. So yeah, you want to jump in and kind of go from there? Yeah, I mean, I think that conservation practices are, are something that, you know, we should pay attention to. It should be one of the paramount items that we that we consider when we're going to go on musky fishing. Um, the fishery, you know, musky fishery is essentially a catch and release fishery, no matter where you're fishing, whether it's Tennessee or, you know, North Carolina or, you know, St. Lawrence River, wherever you're fishing, you know, you want those fish to survive once you let them go. And, and, you know, overarching concept of that is the, the less you handle them, the better off it's going to be, no matter what the water temperature is going to be. I think there are a lot of um, ideas out there that may not be backed by science. And that's kind of where I live in, in my uh, podcast world. And when I, when I come on these things, you know, I obviously have my own personal opinions, but um, for the most part, I follow the science and kind of let me lead let that lead me into you know my thoughts on various subjects like you know catch and release and safe handling and items like that awesome so how do when you know when you starting okay things are going to go from iced up to ice out pretty soon uh in the midwest and um you know it, let's start with early season so um you know, those fish are going to be moving slow in a lot of spots, but, you know, have you seen anyone doing anything fishing that you're like, oh, please don't do that? Or, you know, just what are, what are some good things to keep in mind for folks fishing in the early season? Yeah, so I think, you know, in much of the upper Midwest anyway, in the muskies native range, we have closed seasons during the spawn and they're designed for that. But um, it, uh, most of that is basically, um, it's in Wisconsin anyway, I can speak to that in, a, in quite a bit of detail, but we we have that rule, but we're not really sure why we have the rule. I mean, there's been brilliant scientists like John Castleman that have that have said, and he's a Canadian, so they they base a lot of their um, reg, rules and regulations on what John says. Um, brilliant man, um, and it, and he says that it really could have a negative impact upon natural reproduction, right? But there's not a whole lot of concrete data that has actually evaluated it. There's not a lot of studies out there. I don't think there's any that have truly evaluated musky the impacts to musky reproduction. Now there's one that I read recently on Northern Pike and they purposely tried to fish for them when they were spawning and then measured mortality and, and spawning success. There's, there's, it's like a quagmire of, of difficulties with muskies because they generally don't spawn well. So to measure success is nearly impossible in the first place. Um, but with the pike, they found that they really could, didn't have any impact on, on the population or the reproduction. Now, again, that's pike. So they, they don't spawn the same way as muskies. Well, they spawn the same way. Their eggs aren't the same as muskies. And their spawning success typically is a lot better than muskies. So you can only glean small pieces of information from these other studies, right? So as, as you kind of think about these things, a lot of the concepts are based in like lore or tradition. And in Wisconsin, I would, I would label our closed season as just that. It's closed because somebody said we can't fish for these things while they're spawning because it's going to be bad. And if that's the case, um, I guess that, you know, you're doing the right thing by having close seasons, or if that was the case, then you'd say, you know, you probably wouldn't want to fish for them when they're spawning. But there's plenty of examples like the James river where that's a stock population that's now naturalized and that they don't stock it anymore. It's all wild fish and it has a year on season. 
And so anglers there are catching fish during the spawn, before the spawn, after the spawn, and, and it doesn't seem to impact the population as a whole. So that's, a, that's an example of like, well, if this was really bad in a stock population, you probably would notice that it's, that's a really bad thing. So we don't know the answer. Being conservative is not a bad thing. Um, but it does limit opportunity for folks, right? Um, especially if you consider some of these potential impacts for like warm water fishing. And also if you believe in climate change, which I do. So um, if you believe in climate change and how that's going to impact our fisheries, not just muskies, but everything, but going forward, um, warm water most likely will be an issue that you're going to have to deal with no matter where you live. So, so let me ask you this. That's all great intel. And I have a bunch of questions and I'm, I'm writing down as we go. But, uh, you know, if you're someone who kind of errs on the side of safety, like, you know, I'll typically come spawn time. Uh, I'm usually pretty good. I'll just go to tie in and I, I want to kind of let things be. And I, I and again, that's like a theoretical interpretation of maybe I'll impact populations. But um, realizing that a lot of people have different perceptions and opinions on fishing the spawn and knowing that a lot of people do fish the spawn. Um, if that's the case, are, is there, are there any special considerations you would make um, beyond just, you know, limit handling as much as possible if you do find yourself in a situation where, you know, you're, you're catching a fish in the middle of the spawn and, and you know, temperatures are starting to come up and I, I know that we're still before the, the red line, but yeah. Well, you know, there's a, <laughs> I look at this, from a fisheries perspective. So when we, as a department of natural resources, go out and catch spawning muskies, we, we try to catch them during that time period. And we catch them in a net and put them in a boat, in a tank and measure them, clip a fin off, insert a tag, all right in the money time. And we can put a tag in, you know, we can clip a fin when they're mostly in the water. But I mean, we're, my point is, is that we're handling these things. Like we, we have them in multiple nets, you know, they get caught in a net, we put them in a net to get them out of the net, we put them in a tank, we grab them in another net to measure them because a muskie that isn't fought, that isn't fought out, it'll whoop your butt. So like these fish are green and they're real angry. So, you know, we, we have to hold them really tight and, you know, sometimes they bang around, you know, it's just a cost of doing business. And in order for us to manage these populations, we need to know what the spawning population is and, and we need to know what the total population is. And that's the best way to do it. So we really, well, I say, you know, con good conservation practices handle them less, the smallest amount you can. You know, when we're doing our assessments, it's impossible. And I would, I would tell you that I can't see a negative impact of that. Generally, when the water's really cold, these are way tougher than people give them credit for. These beasts are, are pretty tough when the water's cold. They actually prefer coldish water. I mean, they're not a pike, and they kind of because pike kind of act like trout. Like they love really cold water. But muskies, you know, you get that 50 to 50 to 60 degree range. They love that. So that's like their almost their preferred temperature. And they still race around and smack stuff. And, you know, they're ramming, you know, ripped up and ready to go at that temperature. Um, it's only when it gets a lot hotter that they start to get stressed and maybe slow down a little bit. And we could talk about that later. But, you know, particularly in the spring, you know, one other factor that that most anglers don't think of is like when these fish are actually spawning. So when the female is ready to release her eggs, she is not feeding. There is 0% chance she's ever gonna eat your fly, your suet, your bucktail, your, your anything. So when she's in the act of it, she, she isn't looking at anything. And if, you, if you've ever seen this happening and get, get up close to it, you can drive a boat right to them. They don't have any idea what's going on other than what they're trying to do. So in that respect, fishing for spawning muskies is, not, is a non-issue because you're not gonna catch them. The reason I think that a lot of these laws are put in place is for the fear, because at that time they're typically very vi visible. The fear is that some, you know, jack wagon is going to go out there and snag them, which, you know, that's illegal no matter what, no matter when it is, it's illegal. So to me, this concept of, and, and I want to be clear that this is, this part of it that I've been talking about, that's my personal opinion on things. The science behind it is just not there. It's not there to tell us what the right or wrong answer is on this thing. So, um, you know, from, from a personal perspective, there's a lot of these things that just don't add up to me about, you know, kind of not fishing for them during the spawn. Because like I said, if they're actually doing it, they're not going to bite. And if you're the guy that's snagging them, you should get pinched is my, is my opinion on it.
That's great information. The longer that you handle a fish, whether it's in a net, hook removal, picture, um, holding on to the tail, which I want to come back to because I, I got a pet peeve about that, but, you know, hold on to the tail before they kick hard and, and take off. Um, all that continues to add stress to the to the actual catch of the fish, right? So that's that includes the, the hook, the hookup, the fight, and then the actual capture. So from the moment that fish is hooked, it begins this stressful process. And that, that elevates various blood levels that like people like Dr. Sean Landsman look at um, in Project Noble Beast. He talked about how those elevated levels can potentially cause mortality in fish, right? So um, that whole process is, is stressful. So if I were to give people the most, the best piece of advice, handle them for the, the shortest amount of time possible. If it's important for you to take a picture, take a picture. I mean, we don't catch enough of these things to, you know, to, to worry about that so much. Um, you know, where you run into trouble is when you're trying to pick a fish up and they flop and they, you know, hit the bottom of the boat and they bang around and no one plans to do any of those things. So, you know, that stuff happens. Maybe you try to get it back as quick as possible. Try to minimize the amount of stress that the fish has, whether that means to you just, you know, in the water release, if that's your definition, then please do that. If, if you're like me and as a scientist, I'm a nerd that way. And I take measurements on every single fish I catch. I don't care if it's 23 inches or 53 inches. Um, and I take a picture of every single one because it's surprising how many times you catch the same fish. If you kind of pay attention and fish the same waters enough, that's really interesting to me. Um, I also put tags in fish because of, I have certain ability to do that. Um, so for me, I probably stress fish more than many anglers. I don't have any more fish like go belly up on me when I'm releasing them than anybody else. Uh, probably because I have a, a lot of fish across the gunnel, right? So I kind of know how to handle them. But the thing none of us knows is when that fish swims away, what its fate is, right? Um, there's delayed mortality. There's, you know, you know, that could be up to a couple of weeks potentially depending on what happens with the fish. So it's, there's so much that goes into it. The general rule, just handle them for the shortest amount possible. You know, if you, if you want to take a picture, do it. You know, if you want to hide your spots, take a picture from up above, down in the bottom of the boat. Like that's the easiest way to do it. In general, if you really care about the resource, you'll try to do your best to minimize the handling. Uh, I think that's a, a good recurring theme. Um, two questions, because you've mentioned the comment about holding them by the tail. Um, I definitely want to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and then uh, we have a lot of aspiring musky anglers that have been tuning into these videos. So I would love to hear um, right where you think the water temps happen, where we shift from that pre-spawn to spawn mark. And then um, is there a red zone when, you know, I know that one of the other topics that we talk about a lot in the community is later into spring, early into summer, depending where you are, you know, what is that cutoff temp for if you're, you know, wanting not to stress fish and, and where maybe is best not to fish and, and, you know, what your thoughts are around that. So yeah, um, tail first, then water temps. Sure. You know, so I, I'll be clear on this and I want to make sure everybody hears this. There's no science that backs this up, but going back to what I just said about stressing a fish. So if we can all, we should all be able to agree that a fish being caught is stressful to that fish, right? The, we want to minimize the amount of stress. So as we've caught this fish, we fought the fish, we put it in the net, potentially, we removed the hook, we took a picture, we measured the fish. Now we're ready to let it go. And now by holding the tail alongside the boat, you know, and trying to keep that fish upright or put them in a current or, or whatever you're going to do at that point to try to get that fish ready to go, we continue to stress that fish. That fish can feel our hand on its caudal peduncle it's an unusual, like, that's not something that happens to muskies in the wild. It's, it's something that's different. So it continues to stress the fish. My technique is kind of like a, I don't know if anyone's heard of the St. Clair release, but they like torpedo the things off the boat when they're trolling out there. I don't do that. I, I slide them into the water head first and get them going. As long as it's not like a foot deep where you're going to ram them into a bottom or hit them into a rock or logs, I just let them go. And what you'll notice if you start doing this is the fish will actually very quickly right itself and start swimming away much quicker a lot of times than when you hold them by the tail. So I've held hundreds and hundreds of them by the tail and some of them take off right away. Some of them take quite a while. 
But when I let them go and I'm not holding the fish anymore, especially in current, you'll see them turn into that current right away and they write themselves. If they don't, that's when you gotta, well, let's watch and see what happens to this fish. And, and you'll be surprised at how many fish regain their, their normal, you know, swimming um, very quickly by letting them go much quicker. A lot of times than when you behold them by the foot or by the foot, it's not a foot, it's a tail. It's right. Hold them it by the tail. <laughs> yeah. It's you know, tail. so I, I just slide them into the water head first and let them go. And, and it, it just stops that stressful process. It gets them back in their natural environment. Oftentimes it gets them off the surface, which is not necessarily a, a natural place for them to be all the time. Um, you know, in the springtime that it's real natural for them when they're spawning to be re right near the surface. And in some situations in rivers and some Canadian waters that I've seen, they'll be really shallow where you can actually see them before you'd catch them. But most often you can't see them. And so they're not used to being at that surface, like where we're holding them by the tail. So just my advice, yeah. yeah, my advice is just to get, you know, start practicing that technique of just sliding them in like a big wet sock into the water and, and, and watching them and watch them how they go. Because if they're really in trouble, you're going to be able to retrieve that fish and hold it vertical if you need to, if they're really in trouble. But generally, you're not going to be able to get close to them again once you let them go. Yeah, that you know, it's interesting. Uh, we we had one. I had one fish last fall, uh, and it wasn't a big fish. It was uh, maybe a mid low thirties fish, and you know, the, the big ones have something to hold on to. The little ones don't usually. So when when going to put the fish in, the fish kind of slipped out, and it was you know a little longer fight. There were some weeds around and some structure we had to kind of navigate to get the fish out of the the jam. But um, that fish kind of just slid. And I just fully expected that fish to just kind of, kind of side float up onto its side type of thing. Cause it, it was definitely stressed. And even though that fish didn't really swim off, it did just kind of hover and it, it had uh, righted itself right away. Um, so that that's interesting because I, I have subscribed to the whole, you know, don't pull the fish cause you don't want to, you know, pull water over the gills in a way they're not used to. Um, but I have kind of always held a fish and it's interesting to hear, um, that technique and i think it's definitely worth uh, giving some more attention to yeah and essentially it's just get them out of your hands right because they can feel your hand on their their caudal peduncle their their lateral line that runs their entire body is so sensitive they can actually feel another fish swimming next to them so it, you better believe that when you're you know your meaty paws grabbing them on the caudal peduncle that they know it and it's unnatural and just continues to stress oh that, that's great knowledge Okay, so let's uh, let's shift then to to water temp. So sure. preseason, um, you mentioned that fifty to sixty degree range. So let's let's take a journey from the low end to the high end of that. Yeah, I mean, I you know, in the areas that you're able to fish for muskies, you know, pre spawn, which would be below that temperature, I kind of think of muskie spawning at least in Wisconsin is we we do a lot of our sampling between like forty five and maybe sixty. Um, water temperature and that's when they kind of muskies don't all spawn at the same time it's a bell-shaped curve um, they should kind of show up when they want to show up in that that window but I find that earlier we tend to get the bigger fish in Wisconsin in, in some of our samples and then as it gets later we kind of get some of the stragglers but most most of the time it's you know peaks in that you know low 50s kind of temperature so like before that time and I don't have a lot of experience actually angling for muskies because I live in Wisconsin and can't fish for them um, you know, early in that time, but most of the folks that I talk to, it's like slower type gliders, gliders, maybe big rubber or small rubber or small baits and generally slow. Um, and then as those water temperatures, obviously, as they increase, the muskies metabolism is going to be, you know, ramping up and they really can go even in 40 degree water. Like I've seen fish chase down stuff in the fall that I couldn't believe how fast they were going. I always, I always thought that, man, it's cold. We got to go super cold, you know, super slow. I'm, I'm learning more and more about these fish after, even after 20 plus years of working with them that, you know, every time I interact, interact with one, I, I learn something else. So, um, you know, I think you can gradually start speeding up your, your presentations. Um, you know, you talk about different techniques for actually angling for them. Um, top waters, I, I start top water right away when, when I can start fishing, like I, top waters that I throw tend to be small, but, um, and then, you know, all the way through the year when the water temperatures come back down, I, I still caught fish at, you know, 50 degree water temperatures on top water just kind of depends on what the attitude of the fish are but as the water temperatures increase you can in increase the activity um, they generally you know the stress level of the fish it's impossible scientifically to you know we don't have any data that says 
you know, at, at 60, they're more stressed than 50. You know, when you catch them or 70, more stressed than, than 60. Um, the number you most often hear is 80 degrees. And I'd be interesting. I'm going to turn this around on you for just a second. Um, uh -oh. So, so I'm going to, I kind of think that most musky anglers have the, the thought in their head that at a certain upper temperature, um, mortality on muskies is, is, you know, something that they're not willing to deal with. Um, what, so let's just say at 80 degrees, if you catch muskies, that's the number I hear more often, most often is 80 degrees. So once the water temperature gets 80 degrees, how, what percentage of muskies do you think actually die once they're caught? Ooh, that is, I, I literally don't even have a, a concept of that. I mean, I, I mean, do you think it's, do you think 80% of them die? Do you think 50% of them die? Do you think it's like, you know, 30%? Like, cause, <laughs> cause my interpretation, I'll, and I'll let you think about it. I'm filibustering for you. Um, my interpretation based on the conversations, the hundreds of conversations I've had revolving this topic um, with musky anglers that I'm friends with and musky anglers that I'm not friends with um, is that my interpretation is that they believe it to be very high and I've never asked them a percentage. I wish I would have, I, I really do because there's been some really good research out there that I'm going to talk about, talk about a little bit. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if most of them thought it would be definitely over 50 and I would, wouldn't be surprised if most of them thought it would be 80%. So what's your answer? I personally am someone that thinks the numbers on the lower end of that scale. Uh, I, I, when I when I think about you know the percentage of fish that are caught versus the percentage that die, and if we're specifically asking because of angler induced stress and you know less oxygenated water at higher temps, uh, I perceive below thirty percent. But again, it's it, it, there's it's. It's one of those like funky questions, like, you know, what percentage of shark attacks happen in less than three feet of water? It's like, well, people are always in less than three feet of water. So like most of them, like it's people know that, you know, or perceive at least that muskies are more vulnerable at those higher temps. So people that do fish for them will usually take extra time to make sure that they swim away strong. And so it's a really hard question to answer. I've got some other stuff from your comments about retrieving quickly and, and it's kind of, I want to get into pressure. I'm curious your opinions on how, um, high and low pressure impacts fish movement and oh. retrieve tactics and stuff like sure, that. Sure, that's, like, yeah, um, that's definitely not the scientific aspect. That's the angler part. And I'd be happy to talk about that. But um, so there's a, there's three projects that are going on or basically finishing up right now that, that de are dealing specifically with angling for muskies in warm water. And, and I don't want to take these guys thunder because they've done a ton of hard work um, you know, three master's students trying to, you know, getting their master's degree in fisheries, working on three awesome resources. One of them's on the James River in Virginia. Um, that, that's Corey Bauerlein working with Dr. Derek Crane. And then there was a pond study that Wisconsin DNR was a part of. So I can talk specifically about what we found there. Um, that's that's uh, Taylor Booth. He's at West Virginia University working with Dr. Kyle Hartman. And then there's Peter Jenkins, who's working on Stonewall Jackson Reservoir. I want, I'm pretty sure that's in West Virginia. Um, again, working with Dr. Kyle Harmon out of West Virginia University. Now they've all finished their master's work. And the next step then is them for them to defend their thesis um, and then publish their research. So once it's published, I'm gonna cover it in, in Muskie Hunter Magazine. I don't know if, how many of your folks um, read Muskie Hunter, but I've been the research editor there since about 2006 and and I take scientific articles and kind of break them down for for the average angler to make them a little bit easier to understand have you so, read our, have you read our pre-spawn article in there yet uh to be honest I don't read anybody else's articles in there I, I, <laughs> I just read a pre-spawn article in there and that's part of cool. where our, our stuff kind of comes together where some of the quite the nuanced questions I'm going to ask you about retrieves and pressure and stuff come in um, but keep oh going. sure yeah it, what which issue because I'll make sure I go back and look at it I think it's coming in the next uh, in the next oh. one here yeah it's not out okay. yet cool yeah I'll check that out when it gets gets to my house but um so well, yeah those guys have, you don't <laughs> I'll lie to you if I don't read it I'll just tell you. <laughs> no uh, I'm just kidding um so those guys have done a lot of research on it and let's just say what they've found in my mind is much lower than what most anglers would say. Uh, probably in the neighborhood of what you were talking about. 
is is kind of generally what they found. Now, the other interesting thing that you said that I that I kind of catch on to is a lot of people think that when the water gets hot, warmer, like 80, it doesn't have the capacity to hold enough oxygen for for fish. That's almost never the case. And it has to get so hot with multiple other factors involved before the, the level of dissolved oxygen typically is low enough to even start stressing fish. So that, so, and that's why you're here, because there's so much information that we read about, and it's anecdotal experience without adequate sample size to be you know, valid in terms of the science. So I, I really like, this is awesome. Keep going. Yeah, so it's from the scientific standpoint, I went back and you know I was confronted with this problem I don't know, many years ago. And so I'm like, the first thing I did, I'm like, I got to dive into the data and just find out. So I went to, we have a a kind of a cool resource in the state of Wisconsin, a bunch of citizen scientists collect water temperature and dissolved oxygen data on a number of different lakes. And it's not, it's, it's kind of as partners to the DNR, right? So they're taking, uh, maybe they're a lake association member or whatever. So they go out in the deepest part and they measure these profiles. So I, I just went and looked at some of those and I just get, I grabbed lakes from around the state and there was not one example Uh, No, there was only one example that I found out of the, I don't know, dozen or so that had dissolved oxygen issues at warmer temperatures. And that was only because it was a super shallow lake and it was heavily vegetated. Um, And if you know anything about vegetation, it's really great for producing oxygen, but it also takes up oxygen when it dies and at nighttime. So it's not always the the panacea that that you want when you have a lot of vegetation in the water when it comes to dissolved oxygen it's a it's like a it'd be like a limnology course for me to go into all of it but let's just say that the average oxygen cycle in a normal lake peaks in mid to late afternoon because the plants in the water have been producing oxygen all day they're typically if there's any wind it'll be making oxygenated oxygen in water oxygenated water because of wind action but then once the sun goes down those plants will stop with their photosynthesis therefore stop producing oxygen and they start taking it up. So then as you go through the the night, the oxygen levels drop, the lowest oxygen levels are right before the sun comes up in the morning. And then as the sun comes up, it'll then start photosynthesis again and then oxygen levels increase. That's like a daily oxygen curve of any water body there is. Now rivers don't have that problem because they're oxygenated at the same percentage from top to bottom. They're thoroughly mixed and the temperatures are uniform. So like even at 86 degrees in lakes in Wisconsin, we have plenty of oxygen, seven, seven parts per million or milligrams per liter is the same thing, um, is plenty. Like fish don't start to get stressed until they get to about three parts per million. Um, then, they, then they're stressed. Four is borderline. Three, it's like, uh, and if they're stressed, and this is something that applies to every single topic we're talking about, if they're stressed and you're trying to catch them, the likelihood of that occurrence is next to zero. So if they if there's fish are stressed, the first thing they do is stop eating. They go into survival mode. They're not talking about. They're just trying to be comfortable, and they're not worrying about eating. They're just trying to survive. So, you know that's that's part of my philosophy. It always has been, and I've talked on this hot water subject a lot. Um, and and for for all um, for full disclosure. Uh, on other podcasts, my my personal opinion has been that, you know, I have not stopped fishing for muskies in Wisconsin, partially because we don't get like 86, 89, 90 degree water temperatures here. It just doesn't happen. Sure. And if we would, if we would, it would just be the top inch of water because most of our bigger lakes stratify. And uh, Peter Jenkins study on Stonewall Jackson kind of really opens the eyes to what stratification does. And um, like I said, I don't want to, I don't want to blow the research out of the water, but they found very low mortality rates in hot water because of that stratification. I actually thought it would be the opposite. I thought it would be much higher in that situation because you're bringing a fish out of cooler water into warm water and then adding stress very quickly to the fish. And it didn't seem to be the case. So they had very low, they had lower mortality rates than the uh, James River nor, or the pond studies. Oh, wow. So, I look forward to reading that. That's going to be a, a good piece. It's been a, a, an overdue piece of research. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are looking forward to that. Yeah. So like the keys to all these, these three research projects was that in general, um, when you got to, you know, 77 or above, they use 77 as a cutoff. Not quite sure why. Um, a couple of things happened. Your mortality did increase. So um, generally about 
30 some percent 33 percent of the fish will die if you catch them at that water temperature and and the study fish were were captured netted unhooked held and then released so that was there was a a formula that you needed to follow during that to kind of do the research mm -hmm. and so the other take-home message from that so that's the first thing so about 30 percent where normal hooking mortality is somewhere around five percent so an additional 25 percent or so mortality by catching them when the water's warm um, the other thing though that that was probably the most important finding was that it was really hard to catch them when they were stressed the, the researchers had a heck of a time trying to actually catch fish in the hot water period because they wouldn't eat their baits. Um, many of these fish were radio tags, so the researchers, researchers knew right where they were. The pond fish were in a pond, so they couldn't get away. And, you know, you could go out there and fish all day for them, and they just didn't want to bite. Um, and then kind of a third thing that we learned from the pond study was that uh, – if you had extended periods of really warm water, your mortality was higher than when the water temperatures were coming up or coming off that real long period of warm water. So say you had 82 degree water temperature in your favorite river where you fish for a week and you, you had a forecast for a rig rainstorm, right? And it was enough to cool that down to maybe 78 or 75. Your, your chances of killing a fish at that in that situation, fishing in those slightly lower temperatures after that long period are less than trying to fish for them during that long period. So if you've had stable weather with increasing or, um, you know, high water temperatures for a long time was worse than, you know, on the front end. Like if it was coming up 65, 70, 75, up to 80, you're still good. But once it hit 80 for a long period of time, that's when we found the mortality increased. You're making a really good point. I think there's some regional considerations that bear highlighting there. Um, if you're in Wisconsin or Minnesota or, you know, any other musky fishery in the Midwest kind of, you know, greater area, um, you are going to have cooler temperatures in the evenings that kind of even when water temps come up that stabilize a little better. So that's in contrast to, let's say, some Virginia fisheries. And, and there's different areas, right? Like if, if you're in the mountains, it's going to be cooler in the evening. But if you're um, as you move south into North Carolina, and again, there's mountains considerations, but if you're in Tennessee um, and it's 80s for long periods of times, like those are going to be pretty stable water temperatures. Those fish really aren't going to recover in the evening as the temperatures go down. So I, I think that the context that you provided there is really um, helpful. I did have one more question too, because you talked about the 25% increase in mortality just from one of the pieces um, there. Yeah, so what I did, what I did there was added the, the five to 25 to get to 33, right? Because no matter what, what day it is, if you catch a muskie, you got about a 5% chance of killing it no matter what. So that that's aside from the 30, you know, the, the hooking mortality from warm water, if that helps. Is that clear up what you're kind of asking or it does and it also kind of points out that there's a personal uh preference there like if, if you're somebody who's really risk averse and you know like i, I actually this is a, a personal thing and a lot of this is just because of how much i tie um when i get to around 75 degrees 76 degrees i've historically been pretty conservative getting out and fishing like i just i don't see a reason to i'm gonna tie i know that there's people who do um and i think that again that depends. Like if I had a, a river in my backyard and it was 45 degrees in the evenings or 50 degrees in the evenings, that might be a different equation. I mean, I might go fish in the mornings or, you know, I just. Oh, I, well, yeah. I want to be clear though. It's not the, the ambient air temperature that you need to be worried about. It's the water temperature that, that I was talking about. Not necessarily if it's a hot day or not, because you can have a hot no day because the specific heat of water is really high. It takes a lot of thermal radiation to increase the temperature of one gallon of water, right? It's, the water temperature is what's critical, not the air temperature. And, you know, I, I totally get your, your aversion to, you know, potential bad, bad things happening when you're musky fishing. And that's great. Like I, I, I really describe to the, to each their own. Right. Um, For sure. But I, I would say the best reason it's not the mortality that should stop people from fishing. It's the fact that their likelihood of actually catching one is really bad. So like, if you want to go wash lures all day and sweat, have at her because most likely you're not going to catch one. And there's always another side of the coin, coin too, right? So we hear 33%. We think, wow, that seems like too much, which I, I guess I, I would agree. 
if it was like that all the time, if, if we wouldn't have very good musky fisheries, if, if, uh, hooking mortality and, and catch and release mortality was 33%, um, because yeah. too many people catch too many fish. Right. But there's also a 66% chance that fish doesn't die. So if you look at it that way, and if we were buying lottery tickets and you had a 66% chance of winning, you'd be pretty happy about that. 33% chance of thunderstorms. I'm probably going to go try to fade it until we got to get off the water. Yeah. Right. So like, it's, it's a whole picture. Like I, I would stress that we need to look at everything as a whole and kind of the whole picture instead of grabbing one of these items and saying, then that's the answer, right? Like I don't, I also don't want to try to tell people what to think. I just want to ask them if they're willing to think about what, what's provided out there. So you know, we did find something that was interesting that these stratified lakes actually had lower mortality than the river systems. Because in Wisconsin, I've all the time, I've heard, oh, you know, if it's too hot in the lakes, go fish in a river because they were, you know, kind of hanging their hat on that high, that oxygen thing because they knew oxygen would be higher in rivers, right? But yeah. it doesn't seem to be, that doesn't seem to be the thing. It seems to be the fact that, you know, the fish are already stressed when the water gets warm. They don't like that. Um, while they still can survive in really warm water temperatures, I think one of the ponds was like at 90 and those fish didn't die. I mean, that's amazing, right? We thought their upper left, uh, upper lethal temp was like 86, 87. Like that's what some of the literature says, but you know, we got a pond in North Carolina or whatever that was 90 degrees and they didn't die. So as long as they weren't caught and they didn't catch any at that temperature. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, you, you consider the fish is already stressed because the water temperature has been 82 degrees for a week and you go out there fishing first of all you're probably not going to catch anything second of all if you luck into one and do catch it you know it does have a 33 percent chance of dying but you can minimize 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 that by not taking the fish out of the water and and letting it go as soon as possible so if you do catch one in warm water you should you should absolutely not take it out of the water you should pop the hooks out at the side of the boat. Don't take a picture um, and let the thing go right away. Like that, that's really the way to look at this. And, and if you feel like 33% is, is way too high and you're such a good angler that you're going to catch them despite what I'm telling you about them being stressed, then you shouldn't go fishing for them. Like The context again, here is awesome. I mean, I, I think that the point that we're making is that, you know, our tactics for handling are what changes the temperatures go. If you are so inclined to still want to go and fish when temps get really hot, water temps get really hot. And um, no, I, I actually, that, that was really helpful. And, and thank you. Yeah. I think, you know, that old adage about they lose their teeth in August. I totally understand it now because they get, they get stressed by the warm water and they don't bite. Well, think don't be kidding. They lost their teeth. They're, they're, they're not biting because they're like, it's hot in here. I assume you're, are you deer hunter too? Yeah. So, I mean, think how often have you ever been like dragging a deer, like halfway through your drag and be like, you know what I could go for right now? A snack. Like it just doesn't happen <laughs> at all. No. Uh, if, if you had a beer or some water, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Not, not anything you get on eat. board with that. Yeah. Yeah. I've never gnawed the hind corner trying to drag a deer. Out <laughs> you know I could go for right now. Anyone got a steak? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that that's awesome. Um, well, I feel like, I mean, from just a, there's, there's so much stuff that, and there are, there's tons of like, I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've scoured the, the different forums and read the opinions and, and giving the context and, and using the science to say how much value those opinions have. Uh, not to say someone's wrong, but you know, it, empirical evidence and being able to point to data and, and what's driving a certain decision and perspective is important um, in knowing how much to value it. So uh I feel like that's, I loved the part that you said about, uh, as you know, if you are someone who's going to fish when it's really hot, you know, maybe in the seventies range, you are going to take that fish quickly out of the water and snap a quick picture and, and then set it back on a release. But if, you know, some of us are absolute diehards, like we're going to fish as much as possible. And if you are going to do that, you're going to catch a fish when it's hot, then yeah, like use your long flyers. If you can get that hook out quick and keep that fish in the water and you're going to, you feel like, you've got the confidence to know that you're not going to stress that fish extra, then, um, you know, I'm not going to advocate for one way or another, because again, to each their own at one level, but knowing why you're doing what you're doing is really important. I, I agree with a, a ton. of Yeah. So a couple other things to, to know about this, this trio of research projects. So 
Wisconsin, we did a pond study uh, in the southern part of the state. We caught uh, seven muskies, one of which we caught three times. Um, we caught seven out of the 20 fish that were in the pond. We had one fish die, but it died one month after we caught it. And the water temperature was like 70 degrees when we caught it, 74. So that so was likely, weird. Uh, likely unrelated. Like it could have died. For I mean, that's what I would have said. Reasons. Yeah. Yeah. We also had two other fish that we never caught that died. So we kind of think we might've had something else going on in the, in the pond. Um, and, and so the fish that we caught um, weren't impacted by the warm water. We, we caught one fish that was over 80 degrees. It was 82 ish. And uh, that fish did not perish. And that was happened to be the one that we caught three times. I think that fish just liked to eat. I don't know. Um, but from that, we, you know, we kind of had a little more information about, you know, what they, what they, what happens, right? The other pond studies had, um, some impacts and what they found was that handling time played into it a lot. And that's why I said, if you, if you feel like you caught one in warm water and they're not going to do well, don't bring them in the boat, just keep them in the water and let them go as quick as possible. Um, their handling time numbers were, uh, threefold what ours were in Wisconsin, so like handling and fight times were really high in some of those and all of that, what I think played into their, their um, mortality estimates, even though in my opinion, I think 33 compared to what most people, I thought most people would think is low. But um, the other thing uh, is that, you know, many people may like, I've done a lot of research on it. And so like my opinions are, you know, probably I try to try to be informed, you know, I mean, it, I yeah. Maybe folks generally do think that that number was higher. I'm not sure. But. Yeah. The other thing that they found in the James River, because they estimated, they did two projects, one that was about hot water and one that was about the fish, the muskie population. So then based on their findings from the, the mortality study, they actually said, based on the, the studies that they had done, the two consecutive is that even with a 33% mortality, it did not impact the population as a whole nor the trophy capacity of the James River. So when they ran the models of all that stuff, even if you factored in that 33% with the very, very small number of fish that were actually caught when it was warm, it didn't impact the population as a whole. So that's the other thing, you know, musky anglers, we get, we get really upset when we see a dead one, but I, I'd like to just make sure that people know like it's a dead one. It's not a dead 101. And if you get wild. out on a lake Sometimes and you saw, die. yeah, yeah, I mean, and that, you know, that, that it's all, like you said, it's all in context. You have to take all this stuff in context. Even if somebody harvests a muskie out of a lake, you know, even it's your favorite lake and you're, you're sad about it. I mean, I've, I've had that knot in my stomach when I see that stuff and, and then I got to stop myself and I'm like, wait a second, it's just, it's one fish. And in general, that doesn't happen. Um, you know, maybe it's little Johnny who caught one, his first one or whatever. Maybe it's somebody who likes to eat them. Like at the end of the day, as long as it's legal, like, you know, I, I really feel strongly that we, we got to quit this like bashing of, of each other because we're kind of a more. small fraternity. If you think about musky anglers, you like, have to uh, embrace a certain amount of suffering to go with the happy moments. Like, yeah, it's not a, right. it's not a, it's not for everyone. Right. So just, you know, I'd be nice, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if you hear nothing else like be nice to each other you know i just I, I made a note while you were going through talking about you know maybe that one fish like to eat so yeah if in the future whenever you guys are going through and you guys being the department are going through your different stocking efforts when you find those fish that actually like to eat please breed them as much as possible and try to make it so the rest of them like to um, yeah, well, I had I had a genius idea one time. I was only a genius till I thought about it. But my genius idea was to only raise females. But then we have to continue stocking into perpetuity, which isn't really ideal if, if you're try, <laughs> if you're trying to create a fishery, you know, by self-sustaining. But you know, if we could just stock the big ones, the ones that get the biggest. I like where you're going with that. You know, if so, there's, there's some technical challenges we might need to work out, but for the fishing, yeah. that sounds great. Mostly it's monetary challenges, right? Because if we really want to, we can continue to raise and stock muskies and, you know, until the world ends. But it, it's not cheap to do that. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm confident we could engineer only females. I'm, I'm confident we could do that. But uh, <laughs> so anglers would be pretty happy. But oh, that, the males that's... are the ones that frustrate people. They're also the ones that bring our average length down all the time. So real quick, uh, 
are the the one the studies that you talked about? I know that there was uh, one study that published last summer. Is one of those one of the ones you're referring to? Not well. Corey Bauerlein did publish, but that was on the population dynamics of the James. So that was the first one that kind of looked at what the populations are there and and what they had. That was kind of the basis for the mortality stuff. Awesome. Yeah, I do remember reading a little bit of that last year and wondered when you were going through that. So this is kind of the next iteration of that research. Um, and that article might actually be in the current issue of Muskie Hunter. I'm pretty sure is the one that's the one I covered. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, OK, so we've checked that we've checked pre-spawn and spawn in water temps. I feel like we we're thorough on water temps. And that, that really was awesome. I, I think that there's so much information out there that having the context to make the decision you want to make and, and why you're doing that, that that's definitely going to be helpful for a bunch of people. Catch and release tactics, generally limit handling as much as possible. Um, I, I, again, don't grab them by the tail if you can avoid it. Uh, because that's, Again, that's my personal view. I don't have any science to back that up. I mean, I, I could see a case for it. I mean, I, again, this is, we're still relatively early in this. I mean, I'd love to say that, you know, we've got a, decades of science that have gone into it but i mean there's there's not large sample size of the species that doesn't eat as often as you know is the case with muskies so yeah I, I will say though that that every aspect of my musky fishing and career is based on science so every time i go fishing i i base my my plan on science so while it's my opinion, it's based, my opinion is based on science. And you talked about like how everybody ha can have an opinion and, and you talked about these forums and whatnot. I, I used to be on those and it's way, it's not good for my mental health because, you know, it, it is true that everybody can have an opinion, but on some of this stuff, your opinion don't matter. <laughs> and it, you pointed to, you know, it, we have to, as a community, and this extends beyond musky fishing, but we have to get, you know, social media and all these other platforms make it so easy to, if somebody has a different opinion than we do, to to bash and say, well, I think this and you're wrong for whatever reasons. And, you know, we got to stop speaking in statements and vilifying different opinions. And we have to ask questions and help, you know, like, why do you feel that way? And like, ultimately get to the answer. And the only way to do that is to stop vilifying different opinions. So I, I really. Right. And also I would add that you actually need to listen to the experts. And that would be my only complaint about what happens on those is because everybody's an expert. You know, I got to say, uh, this, is, this is a good spot for you. Like a lot of people are like, you know, listen to the experts or listen to me, whatever. You actually be like, listen to the experts. And then you just get to say what you want and people have to listen. <laughs> but they don't. They don't. Even my best friends, man, they, they we have some really spirited <laughs> talks, you know. You're like, here's all this science. You're like, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I was at the Minnesota Muskie Expo this week and I actually saw Justin there. I didn't oh, get a awesome. chance to chat with them, but because uh, I was talking with somebody trying, I'm trying to sell a bunch of P52s out of Lake X booth. But the guys from Lake X Tackle are my friends, and and uh, you know they they are my hardest critics. They ride me like a rented goalie, <laughs> and and you know we have really spirited. There was there's quite a quite a good debate there in the booth uh, this weekend. So that's awesome. Uh, so the only things that I have here, and I'm gonna. I'll kind of end in summary and feel free to cook on, you know, is there anything else we haven't covered that you want to, um, but tactics. So, you know, this is an interesting spot. We've talked about that. You've definitely done your share of, of fly angling for musky, but the, you know, you generally will fish with gear and for any number of different reasons. And mo all of my musky angling is with a fly. Um, so in the article that we talked about, um, I, I think, I think I included a note, uh, in the article, but it talked about how, you know, with gear versus fly, even two hand ripping it with a fly as fast as you can, you're gonna have a very difficult time approaching the same speeds of somebody who's a gear angler, either with a glide bait or a basic bucktail or, you know, whatever, you name it. Uh, so when I, when I'm fishing, uh, generally it's keep a pretty good clip to it and you're swimming your, your fly and trying to get it to do certain things in the water. But was having a conversation yesterday uh, with, with Nikki Anderson of Transducer Sled and we were talking about, you know, okay, well, on one hand, retrieve as fast as you can because with a fly, you're barely even getting to gear speeds um, as long as you're getting the action that you want out of it. Um, but on the other, I, you know, for every, this is the way you do it to catch fish. 
generalization we make, you have instances where uh, you got to do the exact opposite. We, we were fishing um, this last fall where it was really warm. It was unseasonally warm, right? And, you're in, and this was in Wisconsin. And it was, I want to say it was 60s in October, like late October, which is crazy. Uh, we were in t-shirts and it was incredible. <laughs> and uh, But these fish, you know, they were pretty active and they, you know, they, they weren't, I wouldn't say they were switching to put the feed bags on for kind of turnover and stuff yet, but um, we were kind of in the middle of that before things really decline and starts to get cold towards ice over it kind of flip flops and goes back and forth sometimes. And it did that this year. And um, the only thing that seemed to trigger eats was as slow a retrieve as I could possibly muster for like three days. And then the sun came out and it started to get warm for a couple days again. And then it was quick snappy glide baits and turny stuff and the bite, you know, got aggressive and they ate again. And then it started to get cold again. And those eats were happening on big, long pauses and falls. And um, what has been your experience with breaking the rules? Where do you, where do you feel like you like to do that? Yeah, that's, it sounds like musky fishing to me, what you just described, right? I need, I, I'm sorry. I only need exact answers. Of okay. Just for all, all right. Well, I'll see what I can do. I think that <laughs> In musky fishing, uh, there are only generalities. Like, I, I get, I don't hardly ever do absolutes because you can always find an instance where, you know, the, the fish are going to be doing something totally different than what you think. Um, you know, but I, I do want to re rewind a little bit. You gave me way more fly angling, musky fly angling credit than I actually have. I, I caught all musky on a fly rod, man. And I'm just like, oh, this was cool. Um, and then picked up my baitcaster, right? But no, I was fortunate. I had a really, a really good friend of mine that took me out, um, you know, for my first muskie and it was, it was awesome. And I got a, in, in town here, I have a really good friend that when we are able to fish together, um, he's always throwing his fly gear and I'm throwing regular gear. Uh, and, and he, I, I would call him a very skilled fly angler. I mean, he puts the fly where he wants to put it, you know? when he's casting out and, and he's a, he's a good angler. So, um, when I fish with him, aside from one time, I whoop his butt. And I think it's only because I can make more casts than he can. You can cover more water. Who, who's the I, anchor? Just like Eric asking. Rowell. Eric Rowell. Yeah. Uh, he's not like, uh, out there on these boards and stuff. He's more of a secluded kind of he He's might even be mad right. at me. So, so he might even be mad at me for using his name on here if he <laughs> if he ever hears this. I'm not sure if he listens to stuff, but um, I'll message us. We'll cut it out. We'll put a beep over. Yeah. <laughs> but the one time he did kick my butt was that super slow. Like he he caught he had six bites and I had zero bites, and you know just a couple hours and and he really did what my butt that time and the rest of the time in general I've I've done better, but. Uh, you know, I, I would just say the fly is is an advantage in in some of the situations, and it's a disadvantage in others. It's just the the muskie's mood from day to day is what's going to dictate which one's going to do better. Um, I would also say that in general, if you fit, if you have to fish really deep, fly rods are really hard. It's really well, yeah. hard to get a fly down in some circumstances, like dump casting and fishing that way. I mean, yeah. So, like, I mean. It's more about presenting that gear, that bait in the right location, right? So I, I, I love the, the aspect of fly fishing. I had a, a lot of fun doing it. But I, I think I told you, I said, I can't do it because I can't run a trolling motor and cast at the same time. Like, I don't have that ability. I, I can't chew gum and rub my belly or, or whatever. You know? That is such a good analogy. Yeah, you're just, you're, you're patting your head and rubbing your belly when you're doing that. I mean, it's definitely its own skill set i have a pedal on my trolling motor too i'm not like sitting there with a remote around my neck so picture trying to not snag your fly line around your oh. trolling motor it's well yeah it was a mess days. it was it was a disaster all we did was the bowl was spinning in circles eric's sitting there looking at me going we he couldn't cast because i was literally in the tornado <laughs> boat down down the river and i'm just okay dude all right all right so i grabbed my gear and we were all good after that but um yeah i, I, I have tremendous <laughs> I have tremendous respect for fly anglers. I think it's such a cool way to catch them. I do get frustrated watching you guys. Uh, and maybe this isn't answering your question, but I get frustrated watching you guys figure eight. <laughs> well, I would, uh, you guys is a generalization because I, right. Oh yeah. That's, I see there are, there's no absolute. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking well, about all y'all. 
but I, <laughs> but I am curious. Um, I, my figure eighting took some big strides last year. And I, I think a lot of that had to do with, uh, I'll give, I'll give some credit to Luke Swanson uh, and he fishes gear and fly. I know a lot of incredible fly anglers that also fish gear. Um, but um, we were talking before you hung on. I, I, I guess I'll include this in the video because people are like fish stories. I, I lost my personal best fishing yesterday. It was upper forties. I won't say a fish is 50 until you tape it, but it had potential and uh it it was in the eight and triggered and triggered the eat in the eight with some very specific tactics but before i get into those i want to hear specifically what it is you don't love or what you might change about eating what would talk yeah this is good stuff so so the first thing i would say is that you guys don't go fast enough and part of that's because of the gear you're using right so like on a figure eight I go really fast almost all the time. Like even if my retrieve is slow, my figure eight is going to be fast just because I've had the most success triggering those fish when I go super fast. Now, not super fast all the time. So that's, there's caveats, right? So um, I learned from a, a number of really great anglers, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago, uh, different techniques to figure eight. Um, I don't want to just be name dropping, but they, they everybody would know what I'm talking about if you know about muskies, but the, the hanging in the corner. So I go fast on the straightaways and I almost stop that bait in the, in the corner. Yep. And, and so that, that technique is, is the one that I, that I don't see when I watch flyer fishing videos, most people doing. The other thing is, is they do vary the depth fairly well, but just by the function of the, the end of the rod being fairly limp, you can't get the same figure eight as you can with a cool cue musky rod right so so it's partly function of the gear but in general i don't think you go fast enough in my opinion i'm like oh that fish would have ate if you could have just gone a little bit faster you triggered it you know i actually i love i love that you brought this up one because you're giving me the chance to tell the story from yesterday but two because i think that this is this is part of why we do these is you know there's been limited information and people don't know what's what and you know sometimes those sometimes that's good information sometimes it's not but I very much think that this is good information. So I, I, let's just give this a little bit more. Um, not my intention to name drop for Luke. Um, however, I don't want to just take credit for a technique that he clearly has advanced. Uh, I mean, like we'd fished together another time before, I want to say it was like four or so years ago. And these are definitely like, we're all advancing the craft together. So let's share. Um, fishing yesterday, uh, with Nick Anderson at Transducer Sled, and, and he's a buddy, and, and a lot of people in the community know him. So I, I just wanted to kind of mention um, that's why I'm saying who he is. But there was a witness for this. I'm not just saying it. Anyone wants to, to check it? Um, we're both retrieving. We're actually throwing specialized um, two hand pool cue esque fly rods. Like these are built on medium heavy spinning blanks. Uh, they they're I mean, they're gear rods, but there's, it's a very specific technique and we're, we're water loading big specialized stuff. Um, anyway, so we both have casts coming in and this fish comes down. Um, I say fish, he goes, where, um, I saw it on my fly. It, it made sense. He, he wanted to make sure it wasn't on his, um, we both come in and I, I go into the first turn of the eight and the fish swings and misses. And I come back into the next turn of the eight. And it, by this time, I just seen flash. I didn't know how big the fish was. Um, but on the next turn back down in the eight, um, I actually went a little bit too narrow on the turn. And a big fish needs a big eight because that fish can't just snap around like a little bass. It actually has to turn its whole body around to come back. So when I came back too tight on this, the fish tried to keep up and couldn't. And the fish kind of tailed out this way, like kind of came out away from the boat. So on the next turn through the eight, kind of pictured okay if that fish is starting to try to do a big beeline to come back around on this next turn out to the side I went as wide and when you said you stop almost on the eight I did it fought every instinct I had to just kind of twitch and pause and it was like okay hopefully that fish has had a chance to turn itself and I started to accelerate back down below into the boat and that fish surged and sucked that fly in um but your point about, and we're not going to talk about what happened after that, because that's very sensitive. It would have been my personal best on the fly. I'll um, give you a zoom hug. 
I, I'm gonna okay. need him. I'm gonna need him okay. from the world. Everyone send him this way. I'm 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 this is it'll happen. Fishing. It'll happen again. Muskie fishing recovery groups. Yep. Um, but the technique that you talked about and the differences in, in figure eighting and hanging it on the so when Luke and I talked about figure eight, uh, figure eights this past fall, it was down and deep into the center, out and wide and pause and then come on back down and fast. And then the next time up, you're not just pausing again. Like the trick, if you're trying to, like this was what I liked about what you said on you're triggering an eat. If we've all had fish or a lot of us have had fish that just follow in the figure eight indefinitely. And if you're doing the same thing on every single curve, the odds are really good that that's gonna be the result you have. Because if you're not doing something to trigger that fish, sometimes they'll eat. But you need to realize you're doing something. The reason we figure eight is you're trying to make that fish eat. So the first time through, it's come down, pause out wide, come back down deep and fast, pause twitch, come back down and deep. Maybe you come a little lower this time on your pause and twitch, just being a little dynamic because, you know, fish is going to get a little suspect, especially if it's a mature fish that's either seen lures or flies and um, you know, maybe you mix it up. Maybe the next time down low, you pause out wide and twitch and then go, but kind of keep mixing it up as you go through your eight and, you know, you're going to have more results triggering that eat. Um, uh, yeah. Anything to add to that? Yeah. Variety is variety is key, you know, and, and the down deep thing is, is a great idea. The other thing that, that I'd like you all to consider is where the fish can see your bait and where it can't. And so this goes back to the biological component, right? So muskies can see pretty much everywhere, except for about a foot in front of their head, like right in front of their beak, they can't see. There's like their vision comes to a cone in front of their face. So that's why when you see most successful muskies eat, they're from the side, their head comes in like this because they got it on this eye and they eat it, right? So when you're in the figure eight, if your bait is just in front of that fish, it could feel it, but it can't see it. So what I like to do is, is make them see it. So I'll just, boom like really fast out to the side and and a lot of times they'll just slash over there and, and get it um and that that goes into that pause so i'll move the bait you know 18 inches and then stop it so that fish has momentum the bait they can't see it they're they're right behind it but they can't see it necessarily and all of a sudden it's right here over to the side and they're oh and they it. I, you yep. know, that's interesting so you're saying a lot of the follows that people are, see, are seeing like you know I, I i've i've called it hypnotizing a muskie in the past where you have a fish just following right behind your fly they can't see that they can just feel it and they're trying to figure out what that is then huh in some spots like right i'm not saying they can't see it all the time they sure, can see we're, it we're generalizing but because for... sometimes they're doing this you know as you fly they're back and forth you know their body's doing this and they can see it but they're going straight you know like even if they're chasing a bucktail like if you're going the best the best example i give you if you're burning bucktails with gear and that bucktail is an inch below the surface and it's going as fast as you can go that muskie will come up behind it and in, before it eats it, it goes to the side every single time. It goes to the side, catches it in a high. We and then, sees it and then wham. Yeah. Yep. Every time. They don't ever come, they hardly ever can come up and just overtake the thing. I've seen them do that on top water because it's going slow enough where they could do that. But if they're chasing it down, they'll always get it from the side. The other thing that I would add for, for I use it in gear all the time, is we'll have, we'll use a tag team approach where, you know, that I have sort of semi rules in the boat where you don't take somebody else's figure eight fish. Um, so, you know, if I'm figure eight in the front and you're fishing in the back of the boat with me and I start figuring a fish and you come in and start figure eighting, we might not fish together. We're going to have some problems there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll probably pop you in the nose and twist you into pretzel shape and then, you know, drop you off on an <laughs> island somewhere. Um, but you know, we, we do communicate like, you know, if I fish with people enough, we have a good communication is key on figure eight because sometimes the person figure eight and can't see the fish and someone standing in the back can. So you need Absolutely. to tell them, Hey, what's going on. The other thing is, is we tag team with a jig. And so, you know, I've, I've talked with a couple of my fly fishing buddies about this and it's been successful sometimes for them is sometimes you can just stop figure eighting, drop your fly right to the bottom and just leave it sit there for a second and then start your retrieve again. And a lot of times they'll, bit, they'll pick it off off the bottom or they'll hit it right away when it moves. But for gear, we drop a jig down and we'll just have somebody either on the other side of the boat or just behind them. They'll just start jigging. And the number of fish that we've caught, we brought in on other baits and caught on that jig is incredible. 
So I'm going to make sure I'm, I want to make sure I'm hearing you right away. Cause there's parts of this that I, I I'm with you on and the, the part, so you're saying, okay, if we ever fish together, I'm not going to figure out your fish. I got it. But are you saying that if I have a jig fly, I can start jigging back there while you're figurating? I would suggest that you do. I would okay. be like, Hey, you got something to jig back there. Start jigging while, while I still continue to figure eight. So the person who's, and, and so I use a lot of side imaging. I use live imaging. So I'm watching what these muskies are doing. So that, that technology has allowed me to, to learn the behavior of these fish when they interact with your bait. Sure. Um, that's the biggest, my, the biggest advantage that I can tell you that that technology, I haven't been able to catch more fish. I don't think maybe, um, probably because I, I can see what they're doing. Right. But you'd be surprised how many fish come in. You never see, first of all, mm -hmm. second of all, how long they'll follow your figure eight and never eat it but they'll, they might eat a jig that's sitting right there too. So what more, most often happens is you'll bring them around on a turn and then all of a sudden, oh, they pick up the jig out of the corner of the eye and they're like, oh, eat that. And so um, that happens a lot. That, that technique, I, I, sorry, I cut you off, keep going. No, I, I, that, that was pretty much all I had to say. And it's like one of the things that I've been doing for the last, I don't know, four or five years. And it's it really, I'm really starting to get good at it, knowing when it's gonna work and how to do it and which jigs to use. and. You know, I don't, I don't think that the jig is that important, to be honest with you. I just think it's having it in that location, especially when you have a fish that's like curious enough to follow, but might not ever bite your figure eight. I, I had the spot last fall. It, I, it's the only thing I could think of that I would have tried differently, but biggest muskie I've had followed today in Wisconsin, definite over 50, pushing that 55 range, just massive, right? And yeah, it was the biggest one I've had. And it was in clear water and like four feet on a drift out of a blowdown. And we moved it on two consecutive drifts. Um, but the reason I thought of it was because the fish was so big. No matter what I tried out of this raft, I was unable to figure out wide enough that the okay. fish was able to turn on it. Like I lost it on two different turns where the fish just couldn't quite follow along because I just couldn't go wide enough. And the thought was, and a friend of mine who, and this was fishing one of our jig flies, um, the buddy who, who figured this fly out has said like, Hey, you have this spot here, like let the fly just drop. And in the moment, it's really hard to sometimes keep your composure together to say, Hey, is this the spot and to do that? But, um, yeah, I think that that is a good case for it too. When a fish is having a difficult time making the turns in the eight. And you have moved it with that presentation a couple times. Maybe it did take a couple swings in the eight, but wasn't able to get there. That next look at letting that drift and just fall down to the bottom, that might be what does it. It might not be too, but. Um, it's not going to hurt. Like you you mentioned, I, I like your term. You call it like uh, getting mesmerized by the figure eight or, or I, you maybe used a different term, but it was like they're, they're just following because they're following. Like they're not going to eat by giving them a different kind of, uh, presentation it's a vertical presentation versus a horizontal one you know they, they thing sometimes too, right? bite it right and, and sometimes that's the difference right it's between one fish and no fish um i wanted to touch on you asked a question about pressure right and how pressure affects and you know one of my really good friends probably put this the best it, he's a guide in the metro area ryan mcmahon twin cities muskie um he right. he he said you know if i go out there on a lake like lake xyz and there's going to be 10 bites in that day. 10 muskies are going to bite that day. You know, just let's just say for, for argument's sake. And I'm the only one out there. I feel pretty good about that because I might get all 10. But if there's four boats out there and there's still only 10 bites to be had, most likely they're going to be split up between people. Good, good two or three, like, yeah. Right. I'm real careful to give muskies too much of a thought process because from what I understand is they don't really, they're not able to reason. Um, you know, it's, it's a fight or flight response. It's a feed or not response. It's a, I got a spawn response. Like that's to me, they're, they're pretty, the wiring up there is pretty simple. Um, there may be a territorial response, but the more I interact with these things, I, I'm not sure the, the territorial part might just be, you know, if one of them's 52 and one of them's 30, that might be more of a, yeah, I'm going to eat you response instead of you know, I'm scaring you out of my territory. It might be more of a predatory response than anything, but um, yeah, that, that, that concept of the, you know, only having a certain number of bites and then having to divide it up between multiple anglers or your, or just one angler is kind of what I think about when I think about pressure. 
Um, I don't like fishing around other people. I agree. Um, so, you know, like I, I person, my personal boat's a jet boat. So I fish rivers in Wisconsin. I, I usually make float, you know, the guys with their, you know, float rafts and that make them mad, but, uh, <laughs> not on purpose. Of course. It's just, I don't, I got the jet boat, so I use Dude, that, but that's a, that's um, a thing, but that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I figured, but, um, you know, like if I'm on a lake and there's a whole bunch of people out there, like, I mean, that's the cool thing about Wisconsin where we have so many opportunities. There's, you know, almost 700 lakes, 667, you know, classified musky waters. If, if I go out on a lake and there's too many anglers, I'll be like, ah, I'm going to go over here, you know, 10 miles over and sure. get in the next one. You know, river or lake mood that day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and pressure can be good. It can, it can be bad. It, it overall though, like it, it cannot biologically, it can't stop those fish from eating because if they stop eating, then they die. And, and we know that that's not happening. They, they have this, this, um, instruction manual in their head that says i have to eat every so often i wish we knew how often that was that would be really cool research but i don't know how you do that have, have you seen right now there is and i'd have to look and see what the person's name is but in one of the musky groups i think it's a gear group um the gentleman has a fry musky in a fish tank i have seen that, yeah. that days. it's been four days since little musky here ate and then wham t-bone right it's awesome <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's the only time you can get those experiments right with juveniles in a tank. So that'll tell you a lot about one juvenile muskie in one controlled situation. It doesn't, <laughs> unfortunately, that. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't tell us much about what a muskie population does in, in a river or a lake that you like to fish. Yeah. So like, you know, like the Madison chain is a great example. There's probably more hours per acre of muskie angling pressure out there than anywhere else in Wisconsin. And that fishery just continues to pump out lots of fish and, and big fish too. And so the pressure has more of an effect on anglers in the, in the respect of, you know, being in the way of someone else or someone else being in your way. Um, and then, you know, you divide that up with, hey, you know, there's only a certain number of bites that are gonna happen in a day. And, yeah. you know, if there's more people out there, it's harder for you to get more bites. So body language, musky body language. Um, as you have more experience angling, and if you disagree with any of this, please jump in. Um, you will have a read for how hot a fish is often. Um, and, and sometimes they're aggressively swinging and sometimes they are interested, but skeptical. You know, like in, in like on high pressure waters, I've noticed that there's fish that are, They've definitely seen a ton of stuff before and they're not just jumping out and surging and eating it because they they they're a little more wary in those spots but um how you ate um how you figure eight and the timing for when you might choose to let something drop um make sure that you're reading that fish and not just reacting it's really easy for us and obviously i'm not talking to you jordan i know that you know this um, it's really easy for us as anglers and we've all done it where whether that's a high 20s low 30s musky and you haven't seen a fish in a number of times out um or that's you know a big and uh, it's easy to get excited and not necessarily keep your composure and think about what you're doing while you're doing it so if you know before you're fishing that hey this is a trophy class fishery here. I might see a giant. Let's just decide in advance that when that happens, we're going to keep our beep together. Um, it might be a good spot to just think that through in advance. Like, what would I do if I saw a giant right here? Like, if it's one of your first giants that you've seen in the water, you may not, you may not execute perfectly. Um, but reading that fish and getting a sense for how you think it might respond to different tactics is going to be the difference between saying, oh, I'm in the middle, I've done three turns in this figure eight, this fish has done the exact same thing, no matter what I throw at it, maybe this is a good spot to let it drop with a jig fly, or if you're, if your friends in the back, hey, come up here and jig on the edge of this eight, or, you know, whatever you're communicating, but um, yeah, I did anything to add to that one? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you make a lot of great points, I, I think that it kind of circles back to what we first started talking about, and you know, I always have a plan with the people I fish with. I, I don't fish with a ton of different people. I fish mostly with my family because I don't have you know, unlimited amounts of time to like, I'd like to fish with a lot of folks in the industry and, and people that I know, but 
my priorities my always been my family and it always will be and so when they want to go that's who I fish with but you know so we have a plan even before we get on the water and you mentioned like you know poop in your pants when a, and a giant one shows up well I don't know any way to not avoid that. Like when it happens the first time, you're gonna, you're gonna <laughs> screw up. Like, Odds are good. Yeah. The only thing I would say is like, make sure you do figure eight. Like and and pretend like I tell everybody if they're new fishing muskies or new fishing with me, I'm like, you know, I don't know how much or little you know, but I would appreciate if you would pretend there's a muskie behind every single cast. And so you're at least your first turn in that figure eight, you should be acting like there's a muskie right behind it. And you think that fish is going to eat, you know, and that kind of goes towards your description of, you know, reading the, the fish. Like you, the only way you can learn what the body language of a muskie is, is to interact with a bunch of them. I'm, I'm so, over here laughing. Know. I'm over here laughing because I'm going to tell on myself. Um, I don't remember how old I was, but I was a kid still. Like I, I've got to say, I was 11, 12 years old ish. It just I was definitely a kid still, and it was one of my first. It actually was my first musky cast, my first time. I was going to say one of, but it was definitely my first time out. My first time, um, I had become proficient with a bait caster like the previous weekend, and then my cousin was like, "All right, we're going to go." Um, and I was thrown a little black, red, and with a silver blade, maps, bucktail, and a hot, large fish came. This fish was going to eat. And we didn't have the figure eight conversation before. And I was, I was a little kid. It scared me so bad, I ripped my rod out of the water. So for those of you who are aspiring to really become serious about this, maybe you've only done it a few times. If you do mess up, like, don't be hard on yourself, laugh at it and embrace it because that's part of what makes it so awesome is taking that feedback the next time around and having it come together. And yeah. Um, I will say that if you do take your bait out of the water, it's really hard to catch them. Like, ah, almost impossible. That yeah, it's just true. It's almost impossible. I'm sure there's that one person that's gonna be like, actually, sometimes they jump. <laughs> yeah, my, my buddy, he's uh, he's got a horseshoe. He put his, he was putting the trolling motor down on a spot on Lake of the Woods one year. And as he put the trolling motor down, he had his rod in his hand and his bait hit the water and got eaten. So it was almost out of the water. If yeah. your buddy ever wants to go fly fishing, you please let's yeah. go ahead and connect. He's welcome in the boat. Uh, yeah, but he's so lucky you didn't, you wouldn't have a chance. So listen, musky fishing is a team sport. <laughs> I'm, and I take pride in my net skills. So yeah, uh, I feel like we covered a ton of really great stuff. Uh, do you have anything else that you would want to run through just that we haven't touched on that you feel like our, our viewers and our listeners would, would benefit from? I'm going to turn those things off. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No worries. No, I, you know, I would just say, you know, for, for the musky anglers out there, um, you know, if you have questions about the resources, you should talk to the professionals because like it's, it's our job to know. Um, you know, I'm not going to tell you that we we're omniscient and we know everything about every resource, but I would say it's a great place to get information on, on management, on stocking, on philosophy, because that's one thing that kind of is, is lost in the, um, the shuffle of fisheries management is like, you know, say you have your favorite river you like to fish and you're like, you know, 10 years ago, I used to be able to go out there and, you know, we'd catch three fish every time. And now when I go out there, you know, I only catch one and I see that, you know, stocking has gone way down and you're like, what the heck, you know, and, and maybe, you know, but if you call that biologist, maybe it's a situation where, you know, there was a biologist there for 30 years and they retired and then the position was vacant for five years and therefore there wasn't any stocking done because no quota was put in or maybe the most of the time when a new person shows up to a position, they have a different philosophy than the previous, and then you get a different management style. So like on that particular river, maybe the biologist is like, well, I'd rather manage for trophies versus, you know, numbers. And therefore you'd cut the stocking quotas to a certain level so that you achieve a lower density fishery where your odds of catching a bigger fish are better. And maybe that corresponds with a regulation change. Maybe that corresponds with habitat improvement. Or maybe, maybe another higher density. Or maybe another higher density fishery was nearby and they said, we're going to focus that there and we're going to do lower density here. I, I, but having Right. Yeah. Resource allocation issues. That's a huge one in, in Wisconsin in particular. And this is something that 
you know, like Minnesota is having trouble with, you know, they, they have really big lakes. They have a hundred musky lakes and a, and a bunch of rivers, but they have really big lakes and their hatchery capacity is not enough to stock all those really big lakes all the time. So th their populations have, have now kind of come down from what they were in the kind of mid to late 2000s, like 2006 to nine, I would say maybe six to 10. They were really high on those lakes. And, and now the popular the numbers per acre are, are coming down because the hatchery capacity is is not robust enough to stock all of them at really high densities. It's not that the hatchery system is bad. Their, their hatchery system is fine. It just doesn't have the capacity, right? On top of that, in Wisconsin, we have been operating on the same budget for propagation for growing fish in the last 15 years. Like we we're we're trying to make more fish with less, even though growing fish is more expensive every single year. And then anglers expect the same result as from 15 years ago, right? It seems like musky anglers a lot of the time have a really good memory. And sometimes that memory really has nothing to do with the current conditions are or or what the fishery is today. So I would just, you know, having said all that gibberish, call find out who your local biologist is, call them start a relationship with them because you'll i think in general you'll probably be a, a more happy angler because you'll understand the rationale for why certain things are happening in your favorite water yeah and if you don't know who that is give me a call i'll find out who it is and and get your phone number yeah and if, if you're not going to go out and reach out to jordan or maybe you're in a different area of the country like feel free to reach out to us too and let us know we'll definitely connect you with the right people uh you know, the, you said one thing about conservation, and I actually really like it. Um, folks are starting to do more around conservation to try to help the species and help those stocking efforts just in the community, uh, which has been really, really good to see. Um, and I think that the context of understanding that, you know, funding has technically decreased, right? Even if it's exactly the same with inflation and, and price increases and all the stuff that's gone into it. Um, you know, if you're in a position where you want to help, uh, you know, stocking efforts or otherwise, um, please reach on out. We'll make sure you're connected to the right person to be able to impact your local fishery. Um, yeah, and if there's anything else that we've left out, if you still have questions after watching this, send those in. Happy to connect with either Jordan or, or one of his peers around the country. Um, or if you're up north, uh, up into Canada, definitely happy to do that too. But uh, Jordan, thank you very much for coming on and doing this. This was fun. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, everyone who joined us and, and watched this episode, thank you for being part of Muskie Town's Let's Talk Fly Fishing, and we'll see you on the next one.